This week marks 30 years since the Berlin Wall came down. It signalled the end of a decades-long Cold War that bitterly divided East and West. So, what sort of legacy did the wall leave behind? And did it bring about a new world order? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the programme. I'm Darren Jordan. It was the single most important moment since the end of the Second World War. On the night of November 9th, 1989, the Berlin Wall came down. It drew to a close one of Europe's darkest chapters. Since 1961, the wall was a physical reminder of a divided East and West, the Soviet Union on one side and NATO and its Western allies on the other. Hundreds of East Germans climbed on top of the wall, chipping away at the concrete with hammers. On the other side, their cousins came out in support in their thousands. The East Germans were shouting for freedom and democracy after decades of communist rule. Television cameras broadcast the jubilant scenes around the world. Well, let's have a look at some of the events that led to the rise and the fall of the Berlin Wall. Well, at the end of World War II, Germany was divided. The US, UK and France controlled West Germany and the Soviet Union, the East. The East German government erected the wall in 1961 to stop an exodus of millions of people to the West. In 1989, revolutions in European states inspired many East Germans to demand greater freedom. On November 9 that year, days after half a million people protested in East Berlin, the Berlin Wall came down. Well, that led to Germany's formal reunification on the 3rd of October, 1990. Well, let's now get the thoughts of our guests. Joining us first from Berlin, Henning Meyer. He's Managing Director of Social Europe Publishing and Consulting. That's a public policy and business consultancy. In Moscow, Viktor Olevich, lead expert at the Centre for Actual Politics. That's a think tank. And in London, Elizabeth Braw, Senior Research Fellow at the Modern Deterrence Project at RUSI and author of God Spies, the Stasi's Cold War espionage campaign inside the church. A warm welcome to you all. Henning Mayer, let me start with you, if I may, there in Berlin, because you're there where it all happened 30 years ago. What do you think the Berlin Wall came to symbolise for people living on both sides? And what, what has re reunification meant uh, for the people of Germany? Well, the Berlin Wall was obviously the symbol of uh, the, div the divide in the country that I grew up in. I mean, I personally grew up in the southwest part of Germany, so I had a artificial knowledge, if you wish, of, of the wall itself. So nothing compared to what is now the, or was the case in Berlin. Um, and it was uh, universally greeted in '89 when the wall came down, and one year later when the country uh, uh, united. So that was uh, a big time for celebration, and it's good to commemorate it 30 years on. And what did it what did reunification mean then for the German people? Well, it, it meant uh, it meant the end of uh, of the divided country. It was also coming back to what you might want to call normalization of German politics and policy. Uh, so obviously, uh, ever since the Second World War, uh, having a divided country was seen as uh, an extraordinary circumstance. So uh, from the beginning on, uh, the policy objective was to reunify at some point. Um, and that was basically the end of the, the first chapter after the Second World War and the beginning of something new, uh, basically. So it was a, it was a great time of, uh, of, a, of a new start for a united country. Let's bring in Viktor Olevich there in Moscow. Uh, Viktor, let's remind our viewers that the Russian president, Vladimir Putin, at the time was a young KGB officer stationed in East Germany, uh, in Dresden, I think it was. He must have been deeply alarmed as he watched all these Stalinist regimes in East and Central Europe collapse around him. Well, the decision to uh, go for, uh, to give a green light for German reunification of course, came uh, from Moscow. It was the Soviet authorities at that time under uh, Mikhail Gorbachev who had decided that uh, the Soviet Union could no longer uh, or did not uh, want to manage the Cold War with the West, uh, that it was not in its uh, national interest. And uh, there were a number of reasons for, for that. For starting from the increasing economic difficulties in the Soviet Union in the early, mid and late 80s uh, to the uh, unwillingness of Moscow's unwillingness to support 
its uh, Eastern European allies, including East Germany, financially uh, and in other uh, terms, and also uh, the fact that the Soviet political leadership uh, itself uh, did not uh, any longer uh, subscribe uh, to a large extent to the Marxist-Leninist ideology that stood at the core of the Soviet state for almost uh, 70 years. And so all that led to the decision to launch the so-called perestroika and to uh, essentially uh, give up control uh, of the Eastern okay. European allies of the Soviet Union. Uh, now, uh, the KGB that you mentioned uh, a few minutes ago where uh, the current Russian president uh, served uh, at that time actually played an instrumental role in, uh, in uh, letting Eastern European allies and satellite states uh, leave the Soviet, uh, uh, the Soviet bloc. So uh, at that time, uh, Putin actually uh, was quite supportive uh, of those policies. All right, uh, Victor, we'll come back to the issue of perestroika and glasnost a little later in the program. Elizabeth Braw there in London, let me bring you into the debate. I mean, the Berlin Wall came to represent the lack of freedoms, I guess, under communism. But, uh, but more significantly, how do you think it came to symbolize the Cold War and this ideological divide between East and West? Well, it was clearly the most obvious symbol of the Cold War and the division between uh, those two parts that were fighting each other. And uh, I personally, um, that's, it's my lasting memory of the, of the Cold War. My grandparents took me to East Berlin from Sweden to see the wall and it left uh, um, uh, an enduring memory. And now uh, we also have to remember that on both sides of, of that German, uh, of, the, uh, of the Berlin Wall and also of the border between the two Germanies were enormous numbers of soldiers that were stationed, uh, NATO soldiers, so West German, American, British, uh, French and so forth on one side and East German and Soviet soldiers on the other side. It could easily have come to a major clash between the two sides in Germany and it would have been disastrous for Germany. So I think we're all grateful that uh, the 9th of November happened so peacefully. Yeah, uh, Henning Mayer there in Berlin, let's bring you back into the conversation here because after the initial euphoria, I mean, reunification brought about some hard times, especially for people living in the old uh, East Germany. For them, it meant unemployment. It also meant a sense, perhaps, of insecurity, didn't it? Uh, yes, absolutely. I mean, obviously, it was a massive task to integrate uh, a whole population, also, especially in economic terms, into what amounted to the Western German um, um, economic system. Uh, and actually, we're seeing these repercussions until today. So, quite interestingly, a bit... In, in contrast to previous decades ago, I mean, I remember I was on Al Jazeera as a presenter's friend in London 10 years ago when it was the 20th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall. Uh, this time around, there's a lot of introspection of whether, you know, also looking at the downside. So what wasn't managed that well? So the, la the, the first sort of 20 years was basically, yes, we reunified, you know, that was the historic achievement, uh, the Ostpolitik and all the rest of it. Uh, but now there is a, especially also, uh, you know, against the backdrop of uh, some of these populist parties doing well, especially in Eastern, in Eastern Germany, uh, is we have to be honest and also have a look at what didn't work so well and, and how to address this. So, uh, yes, it was a, a mammoth task. It still is a, a big task in, uh, to, to a large extent. Um, but it's obviously it was an unprecedented situation. It hasn't happened before. Uh, Viktor Olovich uh, in Moscow. I mean, with the collapse of the Berlin Wall uh, and the reunification of Germany, many Russians actually blame Mikhail Gorbachev, you mentioned him earlier, uh, and Glasnost and Perestroika for the collapse of the old Soviet Union. But was he really to blame, do you think? Well, the uh, dreams uh, and uh, hopes of the Soviet leadership of that uh, time uh, certainly did not materialize in the way that, uh, that uh, they were uh, looking for. Uh, the Soviet leadership under Gorbachev and uh, the, the staff around him were certainly hoping for, to integrate uh, the Soviet Union, what remained uh, of it, into a more uh, Western-style uh, alliance of states. And uh, they were looking to, uh, for Moscow to become, in a way, a junior partner uh, to the United States in a new world order. Now, of course, uh, throughout the 1990s, uh, 
uh, as Russia became an independent state with the 14 other Soviet, uh, ex-Soviet republics also beca becoming sovereign countries, uh, uh, NATO, of course, was moving uh, eastward and uh, uh, finally uh, taking three uh, Baltic states, Lithuania, Latvia and Estonia, uh, as its members. And, of course, Russia also, the Russian uh, leadership also saw that the United States and some of its European allies uh, did not uh, support uh, the Russian position on uh, Chechnya and on its own territorial sovereignty uh, too vigorously. They felt that uh, Washington, uh, London and some other European capitals were not very supportive. Uh, they were also worried about uh, the Bush, uh, the George H. W. Bush administration abrogating, unilaterally abrogating the anti-ballistic missile treaty in 2003 and starting to build anti-missile uh, facilities around Russia's borders. All of, the, uh, all of that taken together with uh, what Moscow saw as the unwillingness of uh, the United States and its allies to truly integrate uh, Russia more, uh, more deeply into its okay. institutions, uh, that certainly caused uh, people both in Russia's leadership and among the populace to be disenchanted with Gorbachev's policies and uh, the policies of his successors who were looking uh, and hoping for that integration. And that's when uh, Russia's uh, resurgence, uh, the foreign policy, the changes in foreign, its foreign policy and its uh, foreign policy resurgence uh, really... Uh, started in the early 2000s. Elizabeth Brewer, it is interesting, though, to compare the Cold War of then uh, and the new Cold War now, with countries carrying out cyber attacks and trying to subvert other countries. Was it naive back then, at the end of the Cold War, to think countries could coexist peacefully, perhaps? Well, absolutely was, even though all the pundits of the day seem to agree that that was a perfectly reasonable uh, position to take. Now, if you look at kids in, in the sandbox, I mean, it, it's, they just never get along, and it's like that with countries too. They can... Uh, they can establish rules and more or less adhere to them, but it's it's naive and even foolish to think that they will all, all of a sudden all just agree. And that's what has happened. Uh, there hasn't been agreement on which country should be play the leading part in the world. And so uh, the, the US uh, leading role, which we have had now for for a number of years, is being challenged not just by Russia, but by China as well. Not uh, primarily through mil military aggression, but through other ways, which you mentioned, for example, cyber attacks and, and disinformation. Um, Henning Meyer uh, in Berlin. I mean, let's not forget that the German Chancellor, Angela Merkel, also came from the old East Germany. How did those events, do you think, shape her politically? Because she may be an East German success story, uh, but she remains deeply unpopular in the East of the country, doesn't she? Well, it depends. I mean, uh, certainly not at the beginning of her chancellorship. She wasn't un un unpopular. She, she was more or less, actually, when she took over the helm uh, from Gerhard Schröder, that there was, you know, uh, there was no glass ceiling anymore. There was no obstacle for somebody who grew up in the eastern part of Germany to actually become chancellor and, you know, go, go to the highest office. So that was actually, at the beginning, uh, quite the opposite. That was seen as, look, we've got the same uh, chances uh, as, as people coming from, uh, from the West. But uh, let me make a, a quick remark on the on the what happened after the end of the the the, the, the Cold War the conflict uh, to my uh, in my view it's been not superseded but at least complemented now by uh, an economic conflict uh, a, an economic conflict of systems uh, that you can see now uh, which is uh, inter interconnected with the issue that you talked about about cyber attacks and uh, given that how data and and uh, and intellectual property and everything that digital is is a foundation of modern capitalism. Um, so the the conflict between states uh, has been uh, has been played out uh, more and more in the economic area. And I think you know we just shifted the the, the scene a bit. Uh, but you can see that today that there is a, a big conflict of economic. Uh, uh, philosophies, if you, if you wish so, which comes with power, which is, is a new game in town as far as I'm concerned. Uh, Viktor Olovich, I want to speak to you briefly uh, about um, Vladimir Putin, because how did those events back in 1989 shape him, do you think, uh, in driving the re-emergence of Russia as a, super, as a superpower? Because many people say when the Soviet Union collapsed, Vladimir Putin was embarrassed. Um, and, you know, he, he basically wanted to help get Russia, re-emerge Russia on the international stage? 
Well, I think what really shaped uh, Putin's uh, worldview at that time was the fact that uh, it seemed uh, to him that the Soviet Union gave up its uh, a, a predominant uh, role in Eastern Europe and in other uh, regions. It allowed Eastern European states to move into the Western sphere. Uh, it allowed uh, some uh, former Soviet republics to also move into the Western sphere. Uh, the Soviet Union itself uh, collapsed uh, into uh, 15 uh, states, as I said before. And what did, the, what did Moscow get, get for it from the West? Uh, in his worldview, uh, and in the view of uh, millions of uh, Russians, uh, the Soviet, the uh, Rus Russia, the ex-Soviet Union got nothing uh, for it and became a much uh, weaker state that uh, Washington and its allies no longer took as seriously as they did uh, when it was one of the two leading superpowers. And so, uh, what uh, inf so Putin at that point understood uh, or thought and thinks uh, that uh, in order for Western powers and, and other uh, world powers to, uh, to um, take into account Russia's interests and Russia's positions on various international topics, Russia has to be strong, Russia has to be assertive, uh, and uh, at times Russia uh, has to be uh, proactive in uh, in uh, stating its goals and promoting them on the international stage. And that's one of the reasons that, the, that Russia's Moscow's foreign policy under Putin since uh, the beginning of 2000s has become more assertive uh, and uh, more vigorous okay. as far as its uh, dealings with, uh, with its Western uh, counterparts. Elizabeth Brewer, I mean, for a few years after the fall of the Berlin Wall, America didn't have any major competitors. Let me ask you, how has that changed? And are we now seeing superpowers like China uh, mount serious challenges to US dominance? Yes, we absolutely are. We have to remember how incredibly fragile those early years after German reunification were when uh, Soviet soldiers and, and then subsequently Russian soldiers were still stationed in East Germany. I was a student there at the time, Eastern Germany, I should say, and uh, Soviet so soldiers were being uh, gradually withdrawn, but they were still there until 1994. And we are very lucky that there was no incident involving uh, Russia and, and the West uh, during that period. Uh, but we are seeing that increasing uh, tension in the world. And, and as has been said by, by other speakers, it, it's... Um, it's essentially a, a, a way of weakening, an effort to weaken Western countries individually or collectively by sowing discord, by creating fear. And essentially, it's, it's a very effective way of, of um, increasing one's position in the world. Uh, not just Russia, China as well, North Korea, Iran. And these are all countries that would struggle, I think, to defeat NATO militarily, but by weakening uh, Western societies uh, domestically and their cohesion, they are, these countries are achieving uh, more power than they've had before. Henning Mayer, let me ask you, um, how do you think Europeans see Germany today? I mean, Germany as a country, as we know, has gone through huge amounts of upheaval and violence, two world wars, yet it's emerged as a beacon uh, of tolerance, of multiculturalism, and it's the main economic and defence powerhouse of Europe. Uh, yes, I think the well, German reputa reputation has obviously uh, well changed dramatically since the Second World War, and there was a conscious effort to rebuild this. So the, there was no coincidence that the, the post-war policy was the German national interest is actually equal with the European uh, interest. And especially in, uh, in a world that was alluded to already, where conflict lines are becoming more apparent again, uh, I think everybody would agree that you know, that idea that the, we saw the end of history after the uh, end of the Cold War was, uh, was much more, <laughs> was very premature. So, in, you know, in the context of the emergence of, uh, of these new conflict lines, uh, Germany has a very important role in Europe to play uh, in order to make or help make Europe fit uh, for that kind of global, global circumstance especially uh, against the backdrop of uh, a Brexit, uh, whether we see it or not. Uh, Viktor Olovich in Moscow, many experts say the fall of the Berlin Wall defined uh, a new world order. You mentioned it earlier. But does Russia today provide an effective counterbalance to the US uh, the way it did during the old Cold War? 
Well, Russia at this point has no ideological alternative to the uh, so-called liberal world order that the United States promotes around the world. Moscow may not be happy uh, about uh, the ideological uh, backbone of that order. It may not uh, find that order to be uh, to, to, to be uh, congruent uh, with its foreign policy goals. But at the same time, uh, Russia has limited ideological reach. So at this point, Russia's foreign policy is uh, is uh, focused on promoting Russia's national interests, uh, both in the ex-Soviet uh, space, uh, in the so-called near abroad, which Russia views as, as its sphere of influence, to outside regions such as uh, Africa, where Moscow is becoming uh, more uh, active and more assertive to Latin America, where Moscow also has both political, economic, and other interests, and in the uh, East Asia and Pacific uh, region, where uh, Russia has uh, has uh, worked on building new alliances to counterbalance uh, Washington's uh, attempts to prolong its uh, unipolar moment. So Russia is essentially interested in creating a okay. multipolar world order where Moscow will be one of the main poles, not, uh, not a single, uh, not a unipolar system, uh, but a multipolar system where both Washington, Moscow, and Beijing, and possibly some other capitals will play leading, uh, leading roles. Elizabeth Braw, many experts say the fall of the Berlin Wall did help define this new world order. We saw the end of the Cold War. We saw nuclear treaties being signed like START. What would you say is the legacy of the war from your point of view? I think it absolutely is uh, to show that individual citizens can make a difference. Um, so we have to remember the fall of the war. What, what preceded that was increasingly large demonstrations by ordinary East Germans. And uh, eventually those demonstrations and protests became so large that, that the regime saw no alternative but to, to open the wall. And it was almost an accidental event that, that somebody decided to open the wall. But it was in response to those uh, expressions of dissatisfaction by lots of East Germans. And, and we think about today uh, the, the global challenges that we have, for example, climate change, where everybody, a lot of people say, well, I, I can't make a difference. Well, I think we should look at East Germany and see those people, it would, would have been easy for them to say, oh, you know, this regime is so okay. strong, I couldn't possibly make a difference. Well, they could make a difference. Uh, Henning Mayer, uh, just a final thought from you. I mean, how do Germans view the legacy of the Berlin Wall? What did it leave behind for them, do you think? Well, it's a reminder. I think uh, in Germany, it's a reminder that, first of all, there are still some, some things that have to be done in order to complete the unification domestically. But it's also a reminder that, you know, that unified Germany plays a, or has to play a very special role in Europe in particular to make sure that Germany, within the framework of a European Union that is one of these poles in a multipolar world, uh, is able to exert its influence and uh, make sure that, you know, we are not, we're not caught in the middle between uh, the power play of different blocks. It's a compelling discussion, but we have to leave it there. Thank you very much indeed for your time. Henning Mayer, Viktor Olovich and Elizabeth Broad. Thank you very much. And thank you too for watching. You can see the programme again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussions, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And you can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. And from me, Darren Jordan and the whole team here, goodbye for now.